Okay, so welcome back. Um, we are going to complete the nervous system lecture tonight um, with the peripheral nervous system, um, especially the special senses. So um, this is a, a fun lecture because we get to talk about all those special senses, um, your sights, how vision works, how hearing works, how taste works, how smell works. So um, again, that is going to be um, what tonight's lecture is going to cover. So real quick here, just like always, I'm going to go ahead and get my pen set up. I'm sorry that there just doesn't seem to be a decent pen color that really shows up well. Um, I think I'm just going to stick with white. So um, let's dive into the special senses. Um, now when we talk about, this is a little review of the peripheral nervous system, so um, before we get into the special senses. And the peripheral nervous system, remember, is going to transmit information between the body and the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so again, we're, we're going to have these um, sensory or afferent Again, remember that they mean the same thing. Um, afferent pathway just means a pathway going from the body to the central nervous system. So, and we call those, again, sensory nerves. Um, so those pathways are, again, transmitting toward the central nervous system. And remember that's the brain and the spinal cord. And for the special senses, it's transmitting really to the brain. Um, Let's see, we have, when we talk about your different sensory pathways, you have the visceral afferent or visceral sensory. And remember the word viscera means organs. So literally this is going to be bringing information from your internal organs, your internal viscera. Um, so visceral afferent is the same thing as visceral sensory um, nerves. And this is under subconscious control. So you're not consciously thinking about this. So just to give you an example for, you know, for example's sake, um, would be like the bladder. And um, when the bladder starts to fill, then there are certain stretch receptors in the wall of the bladder that detect that stretch as the bladder fills up and will send information back to the brain. And those are those nerves that are sending that information back to the brain are visceral afferent nerves. So you're not thinking about your bladder stretching as it fills up. Um, but again, that's a subconscious activity, but obviously you have to have sensory to do that, otherwise um, our bladders would um, over overfill with um, urine and, and all kinds of bad things could happen then. <laughs> so um, then we have sensory afferent, and sensory afferent are going to be um, those uh, sensory neurons that are underneath your conscious conscience control, conscious control. So this is what we call our conscious sensory. And so we can break this up into our somatic sensations, um, our somatic sensory sensations that again are under conscious control. So for example, we have certain sensory receptors in the skin um, that uh, uh, can be associated with, you know, um, uh, all kinds of things, detecting um, temperature in the skin, detecting um, pain, things like that, and also um, proprioception. So um, we have sensory receptors um, that will detect where our limbs are in comparison to the rest of our body. Remember, that's what proprioception is, is that ability to recognize where in space your arms are, where in space your legs are in comparison to the trunk of the body. And then we have the special senses. And the special senses, that's what we're going to be talking about today. The special senses are going to include vision, hearing, taste, and smell. And so we're, again, today we're going to primarily um, talk about, you'll see what we're going to start with, we'll talk about, um, we'll start and talk about some of these somatic sensations um, in the very beginning of the lecture, and we'll talk a little bit about um, some, some of these sensory receptors, especially in the skin, we'll talk about pain receptors, nociceptors, things like that. And then, but the, the second half of the lecture, which is the bigger part of the lecture, we'll talk about the special senses. 
So I, again, just to kind of give you um, a, an idea as to where we are on this big overall picture, we have um, our visceral stimuli. So that would be our visceral afferent. And then here's our sensory afferent. And again, our sensory afferent um, will include, as we just showed, um, both your somatic and your special senses. Okay. So just to kind of give you an idea of where that is on the big overall picture of things, we're talking now primarily about the sensory portion of the peripheral nervous system. So um, we have different receptors that are going to respond to different types of stimuli and have very different modalities in terms of um, how they are going to function, what they're going to respond to. So we are going to talk about some of these different receptors and um, what their different modalities are. So um, when we talk about receptors, receptors are just structures at the, the peripheral endings of a sensory neuron that is going to detect stimulus, some type of stimulus, whether it be pain, whether it be temperature, um, whether it be, you know, um, sound waves. So again, that, that's what we mean when we say these different receptors are going to have different modalities and they're going to be responding to different types of stimuli. Ty the types of receptors that we um, are going to talk about and classify are going to be um, our photoreceptors. And obviously our photoreceptors are doing just what they say. They're detecting light. We also have mechanoreceptors. And mechanoreceptors are detecting um, mechanical energy, especially, for example, um, you have uh, pressure receptors. And they're detecting that mechanical push on um, your skin. So they're detecting that pressure, mechanical energy. That's a mechanoreceptor. Um, thermoreceptors are going to be detecting heat and cold. Osmoreceptors are going to be detecting change in, changes in osmolarity, and this is going to be changes in concentrations. Remember, osmolarity means a change in concentration of solutes. So when we talk about um, osmolarity, we talked about, again, um, solute, we, we really talked about water concentration and solute concentration. And so if we have changes in the concentration of solutes, that changes the amount of water as well um, per solute in body fluids. So that changes our osmolarity. And then um, we can talk about chemoreceptors. Um, chemoreceptors are going to detect specific um, chemicals. So um, we'll talk about these when we talk about things like taste receptors and smell receptors. And then we have good old nociceptors. And nociceptors are going to be responsible for your feeling of pain. So again, um, if you have any type of um, pain, chronic or acute, you can thank your nociceptors for that. Okay, so again, we're going to start with just talking about, I kind of warned you, we're going to talk um, mostly about our somatic senses in the very beginning here and then we're going to get into the special senses and that will make up again the rest of the lecture. So um, here our somatic sensors are going to be recept we'll have receptors in our somatic sensors that are associated with skin, muscles, joints, and viscera. Um, that's going to make up our somatic senses. <clears throat> and there are three types of re receptors um, that are going to detect touch and pressure. And we're going to talk about these three types of receptors. Um, so we have free ends of sensory nerve fibers in our epithelial tissue. Um, and they're our first type that would um, detect or be our first receptor that's going to pick up um, changes again in, in the epithelial tissue associated with touch and pressure. And so again, and I wish I would have, I apologize, I wish I would have made this like an A because this would be your free ends of your sensory nerve fibers is going to be your very first type um, of receptor that detects touch and pressure. There are two others that's going to be, we'll, we'll talk about them in just a minute, your Meisner's corpuscle and your Pacinian corpuscle. 
And so we'll get to those in just a minute. And those are going to be the three main ways that we are going to detect pressure um, and touch. And so if you look here, um, the first one is um, your free nerve endings right here. And so you can see that in your epithelial tissue. So if you remember here, this is a, a cross section through your skin. You can see these are the dermal papillae here. And um, this demarcates the, the line in between the epidermis above here and the dermis below. And these dermal papillae, these little finger-like structures of the dermis that are pushing up um, in them and all throughout, again, the epidermis, you'll see these little free nerve endings branching through up into the epidermis. So these are the free nerve endings that are out there. And these free nerve endings, again, are going to be one way in which we detect touch and pressure. It's just these free nerve endings up here. The second way that we're going to detect um, pressure and mainly mainly touch because it'll be a light touch um, is going to be our Meisner's corpuscle and that's what this is a picture of here's a Meisner's corpuscle and these Meisner Meisner's corpuscles are going to um, exist up here here is a Meisner's corpuscle and here is a Meisner's corpuscle if you can see my pencil drawing there um, and they're going to be right in the dermal papilla there. So the Meissner's corpuscles are always in the dermal papilla. Because they're so high up here um, in the dermis, they're going to be detecting light touch. And then you have your Pacinian corpuscles. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Um, and this is um, a picture here of your Pacinian corpuscle right here. And a Pacinian corpuscle, um, and here's a... a drawing of the Piscinian corpuscle. The Piscinian corpuscles are going to be um, a bit lower in the dermis as you can see here. So the Piscinian corpuscles are going to detect um, more of a deep pressure. Um, not instead of light touch, it would be more deep pressure. So this finishes that, that off. So the, again, the Meissner's corpuscles um, are, are basically this flattened connective to these flattened connective tissue sheaths um, that surround two or more nerve fibers and oh I forgot to mention this they're partic particularly abundant um, in hairless areas that are really sensitive obviously to light touch so things like the lips so again um, Meisner's corpuscles are going to be detecting light touch and then you have your Piscinian corpuscles, and your Piscinian corpuscles um, are large structures of um, connective tissue and cells that kind of look like an onion. They resemble an onion. And their function is to detect deep pressure. So think Meissner's corpuscles as detecting light touch, Piscinian corpuscles as detecting deep pressure. We also have um, temperature senses and remember these were called our our thermoreceptors um, that are the actual receptors that are going to detect um, hot and cold so and these temperature receptors again um, have groups two groups of free nerve endings one group of nerve endings that's going to detect heat so our heat receptors and one that's one group that's going to detect cold so again, we have two types of thermoreceptors here. Remember, these are thermoreceptors. And so again, we've got thermoreceptors that detect heat, and we have thermoreceptors that detect cold. Um, and they both are going to work best within a certain range of temperature. So again, our, our heat thermoreceptors um, have a range in which they detect, um, again, temperatures. And it's, of course, on the higher end of the scale. And then we have our cold receptors, which are going to be detecting, um, again, how much heat there is, but on the lower end of the spectrum. Both heat and cold receptors um, have to be able to adapt quickly, meaning that they have to be able to detect changes um, fairly rapidly as changes occur in the um, surrounding environment. Temperatures near 45 degrees Celsius, remember this is Celsius, um, will actually stimulate certain pain receptors. Um, also, temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius will also stimulate pain receptors um, and produce kind of a freezing sensation. 
So again, we have um, pain receptors that will be stimulated on the high end and on the low end of the spectrum, the hot and the cold end of the spectrum. And that's, again, partially what we get in terms of our sensations of hot and cold. So stimulation of nociceptors um, is going to be our, our um, sensation of pain. So the stimulation of nociceptors, um, then sent, that information is sent back to the brain where it's perceived as pain. Okay, So remember that what we say is pain is our perception, our brain's perception processing the information from these nociceptors. These nociceptors are just the receptors, again, that are being stimulated and bring that information back to the brain. And the brain is what processes it and, again, gives us that perception of pain. So there are three categories of pain receptors. We have mechanical, again, receptors. Um, that are going to be stimulated by some type of, you know, mechanical injury. So, uh, for example, a, a cut or, um, you know, pinching. Um, that would be a uh, mechanical injury or um, a mechanical um, stimulus. There's my word. A mechanical stimulus that would stimulate those mechanical receptors. Then we have thermal receptors, and of course the thermal receptors um, are going to detect um, hot and cold on the extreme end. So again, above 45 degrees Celsius, you have thermal receptors um, that will, and these are thermal nociceptor receptors. So remember that these are thermal pain receptors. Um, now, not just thermal receptors, but thermal pain receptors. So some of them will detect, some of them um, will be detected you know, dedicated to detecting um, things that are above 45 degrees Celsius and others will be detecting things that are below 10 degrees Celsius. And that will stimulate these thermal um, nociceptor receptors. And then we have the ones that are called our polymodal, um, polymodal nociceptors. And these are going to be um, nociceptors that actually do both, that um, it will actually detect uh, both modalities. That's why it's called polymodal. So again, they can pick up both. Um, so those are the three categories of our pain receptors. And again, we have motivational and emotional responses also um, that will affect our perception of pain. So keep that in mind that, again, when we are talking about pain, it's not just the sensory input, but then how the brain processes that. And there are motivational and emotional responses that will um, be processed in the same area of the brain that's processing um, this information from the nociceptors. And that information combined will give us our overall perception of pain. So um, when we talk about actual pain fibers, there are fast and slow um, afferent pain fibers. Again, afferent is just telling you that it's sensory, right? So there are fast and slow afferent pain fibers. We're going to talk about um, what these are and the differences. A delta fibers are going to be your fast pain fibers. They're going to fire at rates of 30 meters per second. So again, that's quite rapidly. Yep. So these are, I wish you could see this, sorry, I don't know why this comes out, I, hopefully it comes out okay in your printed lectures, um, but these are myelinated, okay? So that means that, and that's one of the reasons why they're so fast, right, um, is that they're myelinated. Remember that nerve transmission happens much more rapidly in myelinated neurons because they have that coating of that fatty myelin sheath that provides that insulation and makes um, the conduction of that nerve impulse much faster. Just kind of like the insulation on a wire. And then we have our, so you have the A delta fibers, those are the fast ones, and then you have the C fibers. And your C fibers are the slow ones. And these are going to fire at about 12 meters per second. And they are, of course, unmyelinated. Um, so that's the main reason why they are slower. 
And so again, we, we want these fast and slow pain fibers because again, this um, helps to give us um, a, a little bit of a more fine control over our sensory, in, sensory input for pain. There is a higher level processing of pain input, of course, as well in the brain. And so um, this sensory information is sent back to the brain and it can be sent to the somatosensory cortex. Um, it can be processed through the thalamus, which is kind of our sensory relay, and then um, reticular formations in, in the brain. Um, remember, those reticular formations can be throughout um, the brain stem. So again, that's just kind of where it's where it's processed. I really don't necessarily care that you know exactly where it's processed in the brain. Um, so again, I don't need you to memorize all this, but I do want you to know that again, there's a higher level of processing of pain input, meaning that um, the that remember that our perception of pain is again because we get that sensory input to higher areas of processing that occur inside the brain and especially in the somatosensory cortex. The brain has a built-in system again for increasing and decreasing pain sensitivity, believe it or not. So we use um, hormones and prostaglandins are one. Um, prostaglandins are these um, fatty acids um, from lipid bilayers and what they do, I mean, prostaglandins do a number of things, um, including, you know, we'll talk about when we get to the reproductive system how prostaglandins um, cause reverse peristaltic contractions, especially um, in, in the um, female reproductive tract um, after, just after um, uh, insemination. But, um, we'll, so we'll get there, don't worry, fun, interesting things to come. But prostaglandins also um, sensitize, and I think I just added this in here, um, so you may need to add this onto your notes, but they sensitize spinal neurons to pain. So they actually make um, our spinal neurons more sensitive to pain. And um, oftentimes we see that prostaglandins, you may say, why would we want to be more um, sensitive to pain? Oftentimes we see prostaglandins released um, upon injury to um, neurons, especially to our spinal neurons. And um, th that's because, again, that's just a protective me mechanism by which we protect those um, spinal neurons from um, further further injury. Um, so again, that that's why we might want to be sensitized to pain. So again, this um, increases pain sensitivity. And then we have um, some natural analgesics um, that actually inhibit pain. Remember, that's what an analgesic does is it inhibits pain pathways. And um, so we have some endogenous opiates, meaning we have some natural body-made opiates um, that act as analgesics. And one of the easiest examples is endorphins. Um, endorphins are released, um, especially when you exercise, and they are a natural pain reliever. They um, help to inhibit pain pathways. So um, again, they're just one of the natural analgesics that our body produces that inhibits pain. So we have prostaglandins that um, increase sensitivity to pain and analgesics that decrease sensitivity to pain. Okay, so that um, is going to take us into now um, the special senses. So again, we're as we, we talked mostly just about somatic senses there. So that was somatic senses. Now we're going to get into the special senses. And of course, we're going to start, as you can guess, with a vision. So you can see here is the um, structure of the eye of many different um, organisms. Of course, I chose marine organisms because marine biology happens to be a specialty of mine. Um, so when we look at the eye, of course, the eye is uh, the sensory organ responsible for vision. I'm guessing you guys probably know that one already. <laughs> so it has um, receptors that are going to detect light. Now remember that when we're talking about light, 
Um, keep in mind that light um, are these beams of photons. And these photons are these goofy particles that actually um, travel in a wave-like pattern. So the wavelength um, that we see of these photons um, will travel, these photons will travel at different wavelengths. And that will give us the perception of different colors of light. So again, if you look at, um, you know, um, something that is reddish, um, or reddish orange, then you're going to see that those are photons that are, that are, as they're traveling, have wavelengths of about 700 nanometers. Um, so they have fairly long wavelengths. Remember when we talk about a wavelength, here's our wave and here's how our photons travel. And so that's horrible because they're different sizes, but <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll pretend that they were consistent there. And the wavelength is going to be um, what we measure from, if we could draw another one here, um, from treff to treff here or wave crest to wave crest. So that's our wavelength, okay? And so obviously if it, we have a wavelength of 700 nanometers, that's a longer wavelength, and our longer wavelengths uh, of light are gonna give us um, that perception of red, red, orange. And then our short wavelengths of light, closer to 400 nanometers, um, so those wavelengths are gonna be much shorter here. Um, and those short wavelengths are going to give us a perception of something that is, you know, purple or blue. Now what's interesting is, and, and I, since I don't have you in class with me, I can't, you know, pick out different people and give you examples of this. But if you were to look at um, your shirt, for example, look down at your shirt. And right now I'm wearing a green shirt. So um, the reason that I perceive my shirt as green um, is because what happens is all of the wavelengths of light from the visible spectrum, so all of these wavelengths of light um, are coming down and they're hitting my shirt. And what happens is most of the wavelengths of light are absorbed by the pigments in my shirt. And what's left are these wavelengths here that are being reflected off of my shirt back to my eyes and stimulating those receptors in my eyes that are detecting that as green. So again, remember that what you are seeing when you're looking at, you know, for example, a green shirt is that you're looking at the wavelengths that were rejected or reflected and all the other wavelengths were absorbed by your shirt. Um, that's why if you think about something that's black, um, like this screen here, the reason that it looks black to you is because all of the wavelengths of light, all of these wavelengths here, are being absorbed by the pigments um, in your shirt. So if you were to be wearing a black shirt, for example, and you guys probably know this, being that if you're out um, on a hot summer day and you're wearing a black shirt, what happens is all the wavelengths of light are being absorbed by the pigments in your shirt. And as that happens, they're exciting um, those pigments and what ends up happening is they release some of that energy in the form of heat. And that's why your shirt, your black shirt, gets really warm. Now if you have something that's white, for example, let's say you had on a white shirt, then what happens is all of these wavelengths of light then are being reflected off of the pigment in your shirt, which means that all of the wavelengths of light are reflected back. And that's why you perceive it as white. And that's why it's good to wear a white shirt on a hot summer day because it's reflecting all of those wavelengths um, off of you or reflecting all of those wavelengths from your shirt. And that's why your white shirt um, doesn't heat up as rapidly as a black shirt would. So anyway, just that hopefully that gives you again an idea when you're thinking about um, light and perceiving our perceptions of different colors. I want you to keep in mind that what we perceive as colors is really just different wavelengths um, that these photons are traveling at. Okay, so let's talk about the eye a little bit and the structure of the eye. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the eye and the structure of the eye while I have this picture um, than this slide really depicts. So, um, the eye is a fluid-filled sphere, obviously, um, that's enclosed by three specialized tissue layers. We have this 
outer fibrous layer right here. And this outer fibrous layer um, is going to consist of this portion right here called the cornea. Okay, and the cornea is going to be the clear portion, and then it runs into what's called the sclera, which is going to be um, make up kind of the wide of the eye. So, the, sorry, the sclera is all of this right out here, all this here. Oops, not not lower in there, but this stuff here. So let me go back here. So this stuff is all the sclera right here. This is all the sclera. Um, so again, you've got the sclera, and then towards the front, so this fibrous layer, which is your first layer, this fibrous layer is broken up into the sclera, and then the cornea, and the cornea is that clear layer, it's the outermost layer of your, of your eye that's covered by this protective conjunctiva. Um, so, um, again, you've got your cornea and your sclera, which is the white of the eye. Then... And here's the word sclera right here. So there's sclera. And then here's, just for those of you that like the spelling, and here's cornea right here. And let me change my pen color for a second here, just so that um, you guys can actually see um, what I am pointing to. Let me change it to red. So again, um, here's your cornea. And so the cornea, again, is going to be this nice clear outer portion here. And then it will run into the sclera, and all this white stuff out here is the sclera, all this. Okay, so it's that outer coating. Then, um, as you move into the eye, you're going to see that you have um, a vascular layer, and that's going to be the choroid layer. The choroid layer here is drawn in as this, I think it's brown, brown or black layer right here. That's the core word layer. And that core word layer is going to contain, um, it's going to contain blood vessels. Um, it's mainly your vascular layer. Um, so that's, that's the choroid layer. The choroid layer also um, is going to extend forward here. And as it extends forward, it's going to make up all of this stuff here. And that's just part of, I should say, part of the vascular layer. Um, and that's just an extension of your choroid. So what happens, you'll see the choroid here, um, layer runs into what are called the ciliary bodies. The ciliary bodies are going to be these structures here that help to hold the lens in place. And they have muscles here um, that make up the ciliary bodies. And what happens are those muscles can contract and they can relax. And as they contract and relax, they'll pull on what's called the lens, one of your main refractive surfaces for light of the eye. So this is the lens of the eye. So a lot of people get this confused. Again, um, you have two refractive layers of the eye. You have the cornea, which is here. Okay. And then you have the lens, which is here. This is the lens of the eye. And that's your second refractive surface. And really, um, your, your lens of your eye is m mainly going to be responsible for your ability to do what's called accommodation, to be able to see things that are up close and to see things that are far away. So, for example, if you're looking, if you all of a sudden get really close to the screen, um, if you're looking and reading the screen really close, then what happens is you're going to do what's called near accommodation. And what's going to happen are these muscles are going to relax and they're going to let the lens kind of bounce back to its normal shape. And then if you move far away from your screen, um, as you move far away from the screen, these muscles are going to contract and they're going to pull the lens taut. And um, that'll make the lens thinner and that will allow you to see something that's far away. So again, that's kind of how, um, how the ciliary bodies work with the lens. And you can see the ciliary bodies are attached to the lens with these little ligaments called suspensory ligaments. Then we have um, what's called the iris of the eye. And the iris of the eye is going to be the colored portion of the eye here. Here's the iris. And um, you're going to see that there are two layers of muscle there. And those two layers of muscle are going to basically control the size of the pupil. That's the main purpose, believe it or not, of the iris. I know you think it's to have pretty eyes, but the main purpose is actually um, to control the size of the pupil. And we're going to talk about how that does that in a minute here. Um, and so then, um, because these are fluid-filled, 
uh, um, cavities, as you can see, it's a fluid-filled sphere here. You're going to see there's this anterior cavity here in between the cornea and the iris. is going to have fluid in here called aqueous humor, and that aqueous humor is going to run in between here and the lens as well. And then, so that would be all filled, this end here would be all filled with aqueous humor. And then vitreous humor will be back here. It's all, you have this big sack of fluid here, and that's called your vitreous humor. And um, kind of interesting, so, you know, if you've, um, I don't know how many of you may have what are called floaters um, in your eyes. If you're older like me, you have a few of them. And um, those little floaters are bits of debris that end up in your vitreous humor. Um, back here as we get older. And so um, I have some of those floaters that seem to, they look like little flies um, in my, you know, vision. And I notice them especially when I look at something white. Um, so we all get these uh, little bits of debris that can build up in our vitreous humor, um, again, over time. So that's your vitreous humor, that's your aqueous, for your aqueous humor, kind of interesting, um, for example, uh, many of you get tested for glaucoma, and um, if you go to have an eye exam, and what they're testing for is they're testing for the pressure in the eye here, and what can happen is if you um, have glaucoma, especially even in the early stages, you can detect what ends up happening is the aqueous humor doesn't drain well here. And when that happens, um, we end up building up pressure in here because you build up extra aqueous humor because you're constantly making new aqueous humor and draining the old stuff off. And if you're not properly draining the old stuff off, then you can build up aqueous humor up here. And um, if you get a buildup of that, then it can cause an increase in pressure, and that's what glaucoma is. Okay couple other things um, in terms of some of our anatomy here. Our innermost layer, so we've talked about, again, the first two layers. Um, the innermost layer, the third layer, is going to contain the retina. This is going to be kind of our nervous layer. And the retina is where we're going to contain, um, that's going to contain all of our rods and cones, our photoreceptors. So the retina is responsible for containing our photoreceptors. And especially in this case, our rods and our cones. Okay. Now, um, there's a special area on the retina called the fovea. And the fovea is going to be this little area right here. And it's going to have a super concentration of cones. What, what that means is there are no rods in this area, only cones. And the cones are in a really high density, meaning there are lots and lots of cones packed in here. So, um, again, our cones, only cones are in this area really high density. So they're really packed in there. So that's our fovea. And what happens as you're reading, you know, the page, and let's say you're reading the word I, um, when you're looking at that word I, reading that word I, that image is actually being, your eye adjusts so that that image is actually focused on the fovea. So that way then, if that's your area of focus, um, that's because that light is being brought into um, the eye on and focused on the fovea. That's your area of highest visual acuity, is the fovea. So when you're looking at something in your, whatever's in your view that is, um, that is the most clear, that's because that image is being, again, processed by the fovea. So again, this is your area of highest visual acuity, fovea. That's your area of highest visual acuity. Um, and then you're going to see this area right here. Um, this is what's called the optic disc, okay? And that's because this is where the optic nerve innervates the eye along with blood vessels here. And so the optic disc is this area of the retina that has no, I repeat, no photoreceptors, no rods, no cones, okay? So this optic di disc is technically your blind spot. Now it's crazy, and I think your lab has you do this, and do the activity with your, um, in your lab to detect your, where your blind spot is. But what happens is you, um, as you detect your blind spot, and I can't remember if it's the cross or the dot that goes away, but as you bring it closer to your eye, and when, at that point where that cross or that dot disappears, you're gonna see that there's not just a blank spot, 
there, what ends up happening is your brain fills in the gaps. So for example, if you're looking at a white piece of paper, okay, and as that cross goes away, um, as you bring it closer to your eye and it goes away, then um, you're not just going to see a blank spot there. You're going to see that, you know, it's going to be yellow if you're looking at a yellow piece of paper or to be white if you're looking at a white piece of paper. So this is the crazy part is that your brain plays tricks on you every day. We don't see our blind spot as being this gap of information, which it really is a gap of information. We're not taking any photoreceptor information in right here. Um, what your brain does is it just fills in um, the gaps with whatever's around it. So whatever's around it, it'll fill in that space with whatever it's, it's surrounding, uh, whatever's surrounding it. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, we have this blind spot and your brain just kind of fills in the gaps for you every day. It's your brain's way of kind of tricking you. And there are lots of ways that our brains do this and that, it, again, remember, our brain is the the perception center. It's taking in all the sensory information and then it's, again, determining how our perception of that sensory information is going to be. Okay, so I think, oh, and then, sorry, the pupil is just going to be this um, area here where light actually enters the eye. I forgot this, sorry, when I was talking about the iris before, but the pupil is just going to be that area where light actually enters the eye, so where there's no iris. Okay, so let's talk about, well, here we go. We can talk about the iris and the pupil right here. So the iris, again, is going to be circular and pigmented. And you're going to see that there are actually two layers. Here's one and here's two layers of smooth muscle that control the amount of light that's going to um, enter the eye through the pupil. So um, here we go. We have, when a pupil is constricted, okay, um, and this is just as a reminder, this is under parasympathetic stimulation. stimulation. The parasympathetic nervous system um, will stimulate, remember, the constriction of uh, the pupils of the eye. So when we see pupillary constriction, you're going to see that it's actually this inner muscle that's contracting. It's called the circular muscle. And here again, the circular muscle is in pink here. So that inner muscle is the circular muscle. The outer muscle is called the radial muscle. So all this inner muscle, this inner circular muscle has to do is it has to contract and constrict and that's going to close or constrict the pupil. Here, now if we're going to dilate the pupil, remember this happens under sympathetic stimulation. So the scary man or the scary bear or scary woman, again, could be, um, scary woman is chasing you, then um, this stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. And as uh, something is chasing you, you want to take in as much light as possible into your eye so that you can detect where, um, again, that scary person or thing um, is that's chasing you. So um, it, that's going to stimulate the dilation of the pupils. And the muscle that does that is going to be the radial muscle. So this radial muscle runs again radially um, and it will contract and it will pull um, out that um, inner circular muscle with it. And that's going to dilate um, the, the pupils of the eye. So again, parasympathetic stimulation will stimulate the contraction of the circular muscle of the iris and will constrict the pupils. Sympathetic stimulation um, will stimulate the contraction of the radial muscle um, that causes pupillary dilation. Okay. And that's just, again, um, to control the amount of light that enters the eye. Obviously, this allows less light. This allows more light. It's also why when you walk into a dark room, why your eyes are going to dilate, right, to take in more light. And why if you walk in, you know, outside and it's a bright, sunny day, your pupils are going to constrict to minimize the amount of light that's coming into the eye. Okay, so the cornea and the lens, if you remember, I... I talked about the two refractive surfaces of the eye. The cornea and the lens are going to refract light as it enters the eye. What that just means is it's going to bend the light as it enters the eye because they're refractive surfaces. So um, in the terrestrial eye, in our eyes, we are terrestrial, um, in the terrestrial eye, the cornea is going to perform most of the refraction. The cornea, again, remember, is that outer layer. Don't get confused here. This is the cornea, okay? So there's the cornea. It's going to perform most of the refraction. And then remember, this is the lens. Okay. 
So the cornea is going to perform most of the refraction of light. Um, however, accommodation occurs um, through changes in the shape of the lens. And so I kind of talked about that. And accommodation just means it's your ability to see up close versus your ability to see um, far away. So for example, here you have a distant light source. And so what would happen in terms of accommodation, um, again, our lens, let me go back here. Um, so if we were looking at something far away, again, um, what's going to happen is these muscles here are going to contract. Here are these muscles here will contract, pulling on these suspensory ligaments. And that's going to pull our lens really taut and make it thinner and change the refractive surface of the lens. Um, so that way then our focal point is where it needs to be, um, again, on the retina of the eye. Now, um, as we come up to a near light surface, what's going to happen is those um, ciliary, the ciliary bodies are going to relax. Let me go back. The ciliary bodies here are going to relax, and they're going to allow the lens to bounce back here. You can see it bounces back to its original shape, so it's a bit bulgier here. And that actually is going to allow now light um, to be refracted back so that, again, it's hitting the proper point on the retina. So, um, again, that just shows you that the lens is responsible for that accommodation, your ability to go from far to near. Um, now, to help you remember this, I'm going to tell you a story about what happens as we get older, unfortunately. As we all get older, our lens loses its elasticity. It's kind of like a rubber band, and it's stretched and relaxed, stretched and relaxed. So our lens is constantly, if you can imagine how many times you look, far and near. Our lens is constantly stretched and, and then a lot of bounce back, stretch, bounce back, stretch, bounce back all day long, every day of our lives. And it's kind of like taking a rubber band and stretching it, stretching it, stretching it. It starts to over time lose some of its elasticity, its ability to bounce back to its original shape. And as it does that, as it loses some of that elasticity as we get older, then we start to lose our ability for our near accommodation, our ability to read up close. So this is why as we get older, we need reading glasses. Now, unfortunately, if you're like me and you are, are you know, already challenged um, in terms of seeing afar. So for me, um, I am what's called nearsighted, and that's because I can't see far away, so I have to have corrections, corrective lenses to do that. Um, so, because my far distance is, is you know, not very good, as I get older and I start to lose my um, near accommodation and lose some of my nearsighted um, vision, then I am going to require bifocals. So bifocals are in my future, unfortunately. So for those of you that are nearsighted like myself, um, bifocals, are going to be in your future. Okay, so now let's talk about the, the nervous layer of this and how we actually um, take the information and process the information and how it goes from light waves to um, nerve conduction that brings that information back to the brain. So light is going to pass through actually several layers um, in the retina before it reaches our actual retinal receptors. So here light's entering and this is kind of cool, it shows this picture here, light's entering the eye through the pupil, again, it's going from the cornea through the pupil, and then it hits the second refractive surface, the lens of the eye, and then as it comes in, okay, it can hit the retina here, the retina is that innermost layer there, and as it hits the retina, it's going to have to go through several layers of cells before it gets to our actual receptors. This is the layer of our actual receptors, and if you look here, in gray are our rods, these are our rods, and then colored here are our different color cone. So this green cone is our cone that's going to detect green light, our red cone that's going to detect red light, and our blue cone that's going to detect blue light. So please keep in mind that our retina contains our rods and cones. Cones, actually let me go back here. I'm going to go back to my white um, pen color because I think it's a little bit easier to see. So, notice this, cones. 
think C, cones are going to detect our color vision. They're responsible for our color vision. And rods are responsible for our night vision. They're just detecting light and dark. And it's our cones that are actually responsible for our color vision because we have different cones that respond to different wavelengths of light. Okay, so now let's talk about how this happens. So again, um, what we call the word phototransduction. Phototransduction is the conversion of a light stimulus into neural signals. So taking that information as those light waves come in and stimulating these receptors here, and these are the receptors, here's the rod, here's the cone, stimulating these receptors, um, so that way then they stimulate an impulse Okay, in this neuron, and that information will eventually make its way back to the brain through the optic nerve. So again, here's your rods, here's your cones. And if you look inside um, of our rods and inside of our cones, we have what's called um, opsin and retinin. Okay, or um, sometimes you'll hear this called retinol. Um, Opsin and retinine are just two proteins that are found in all of our photoreceptors. And um, in, you'll see that this, um, and this is called rhodopsin because um, the rhodopsin is the, um, is going to be responsible for your rods. So we have, even though we have opsin and retinine um, in our cones, um, they're just in a different protein. So here, um, in this case, you can see rhodopsin in the dark, and you have your opsin in your retinine, and it's in the inactivated form. And what happens is um, when our you know rhodopsin here is exposed to light, when it absorbs light, that retinine, this retinine portion here, is actually going to change shapes. Um, and it goes from, for those of you that know what cis is, it goes from a cis formation to a trans formation. So it goes from a bent formation um, to a more straight kind of formation, the trans form of it. And that's the activated form of it. And again, um, when that happens, then again, this can stimulate some nerve impulses. And we won't go through, if you take Bio 201, we go through how that actually happens. Um, but here, we, we won't do that. So the eye transduce, transduces light energy to an electrochemical signal using photopigments. And again, our photopigments, two photopigments are going to be opsin and retinine. Um, opsin is a protein, and retinine, believe it or not, is a derivative of vitamin A1. So that's why they say take vitamin A for your eyes. Um, it's because, again, um, there's, a, 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 again, this retinine that is a derivative of that vitamin A1. So and that's why vitamin A is important for your eyes. Um, there are four photopigment classes. Again, um... So all of our photopigments have an opsin retinine in it, but there are four different classes um, of these opsin proteins. So we have um, rods, which are rhodopsin, and then we have three different cones, um, one that detects blue light, one that detects green, and one that detects red. So again, rhodopsin is responsible for our night vision. And... Our cones are responsible for our color vision. And again, we have um, our blue cones are going to detect or be stimulated by certain wavelengths of light that are in the blue range. Again, our green cones will be stimulated by wavelengths of light that are in the green range. And um, red, again, cones will be stimulated by wavelengths, our shorter wavelengths, or I'm sorry, our longer wavelengths of light in the red range. So just to give you an idea, we have um, in, in percentage about 2% of blue cones per 32%, green cones per 62% red cones, respectively. Um, now when we look at our cones, our cones are concentrated in the fovea. Remember we kind of talked about the fovea, and this is our area of highest visual acuity. 
So as you read the sentence, as you read the word cones, um, your eyes and eye muscles will adjust so that this image here is going to be, again, refracted onto as the light enters the eye and is refracted from this area here, will hit the fovea of the eye. Then as you move to this word here, okay, then the eyes will move and adjust. So this image here will then be, again, um, focused on the fovea of the eye. Then as we move to this word here, um, then the eyes again will move, the eye muscles will again move the eyes so that this word is focused on the fovea. So again, as you read, you're constantly focusing these areas where you want the highest visual acuity on the fovea. Okay, so here we can look at the combined stimulation of our three different types of cones. And the combined stimulation of our three different types of cones is what's going to allow us to discriminate um, between two million gradations of color. So again, you know, how many blue cones we stimulate versus green cones versus red cones we stimulate um, will give us our different gradations of color. And just to give you an idea of how this works, for example, um, if we're perceiving a color to be um, for example, blue here, and let me just change my um, pen pointer real quick. Um, so if we're perceiving something to be blue, for example, here, um, then when we look, um, we've actually stimulated, if we look at the percentage of stimulation of our different cones, we've stimulated 0% of our red cones, 0% um, of our green cones, and 100% of our blue cones. And when that happens, then we're um, perceiving something as blue. Now if we perceive something as green, um, then we've stimulated about 31% of our red cones, about 36% of our blue cones, and 67% of our green cones. And if we're seeing the color yellow here, then we've stimulated about 83% of our red cones, 83% of our green cones, and 0% of our blue cones. So that just gives you an idea of how we get the different gradations of color here, is just um, what the, the maximum percent of stimulation of our red cones to green cones to blue cones are. If we've only, again, um, if we've stimulated 83% of all of our red cones, 83% of all of our green cones, and zero of our blue cones, then we're going to see yellow, and we perceive that as yellow. So kind of interesting. Now what's even cooler is when you look at um, this thing, this is a uh, mantis shrimp. If you've ever heard of these, these mantis shrimps um, are kind of cool. They're, they're sh called the shrimp that packs a punch. And um, it, if you look here, um, these structures here, they have really powerful muscles um, that actually control those. And these are the these are basically they're what we call chelae or claws. And what they can do is they can hammer with them. And they can hammer so hard with these um, with these chelae that they can actually break. Um, a glass aquarium, believe it or not. Um, they actually will oftentimes break um, shells and that's how they can kill some of their prey items. Um, so again, this is called the mantis shrimp. They're really a cool shrimp. And I'm sorry, I have to use marine um, examples here because they're just too fun. Um, so again, man mantis shrimp is really a, a pretty um, amazing invertebrate. And um, they're called stomatopods. They're in the order stomatopoda. And um, these stomatopods are really cool because they actually have better color vision than we do. You know how we only have three different rods that detect three different wavelengths um, uh, of light? They actually have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So their ability to distinguish colors um, from each other is incredible. And they think that this partly evolved because um, they communicate um, with, their, with their bodies. And you can see they're quite colorful. And so they can communicate, again, with, um, again, displays uh, that they do with their body to show these different colors. So... Um, Again, they're, they're pretty amazing that they actually have, you know, they have some pretty impressive color vision, you know, for an invertebrate. Okay, so when we look at how this, so we've talked about all this information stimulating, we've talked about stimulating the rods and cones, and so when we stimulate those rods and cones, they're going to stimulate 
other neurons um, that they're connected to. And these neurons are what are going to take the information back to the brain. So again, as we stimulate our rods and cones, our rods and cones will stimulate these neurons and send this information back to the brain. Now you're going to see here that information that comes in um, here on the right eye, um, information that comes in from um, the kind of outer periphery here will actually be crossed over and processed on the opposite side of the brain. Um, so the opposite end um, from where you were actually perceiving that image. Um, it's at, at an area um, that we call the optic chiasma, where it crosses over. We have the crossing over of these nerves. And then here, you can see on the other eye here, um, the same thing. Um, the information or images that are being brought from the outer periphery here um, will actually, so especially the far left and then the far right here, um, that information will be, again, perce perceived, or I should say processed on the opposite side of the brain. So kind of interesting. And this area that we have where we have the crossing over here um, of nerve fibers is called the optic chiasma. Um, the optic chiasma is where we see that crossing over. Um, and this, all of this makes up the optic nerve. This, all these nerves make up the optic nerve. And the optic nerve, again, remember, is one of your cranial nerves here. So this is where you can see where the optic nerve would enter. Um, again, the brain, and you can see that um, some of, again, these these nerves, many of these nerves are going to go through the thalamus here, which is, again, a relay center, and then, um, again, stimulate neurons higher up in the cortex, and especially in the visual cortex um, of the brain. So, again, vision gets processed um, in these higher areas of the brain and especially again in the visual cortex of the brain here. Um, oops, and I think that was it. Yeah, the, here you can see print. that's where it's got visual cortex. So again, this is the primary visual cortex of the brain back here. Okay. And that's where we have our higher visual processing areas. Okay, so now let's talk about, um, so we've talked about vision, now let's talk about hearing. So, the, uh, when we look here, the ear consists of um, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So again, here's all the external ear, um, there's the tympanic membrane right here, and then inside the tympanic membrane would be the middle ear here, and then the inner ear is going to be inside this structure called the vestibular cochlear apparatus. So um, again, I'm just going to give you kind of an orientation to the ear here so that as I talk about the ear, um, it's a little less confusing. So let's use this picture here. Um, the oracle of the ear is going to be the part of the ear that's going to direct sound waves into the um, external auditory canal. And again, the external auditory canal will actually enter um, the inner ear through the, or the middle ear through the external auditory meatus of the skull. So that's a, a, an opening of the skull there. So this is the external auditory meatus or external auditory canal. And at the very base of that is going to be the tympanic membrane. So what this does is this just directs sound waves as they're entering in here um, to the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Now the tympanic membrane um, is going to be attached to three what are called ossicles. Um, these three ossicles are the inner ear bones, or I should say the middle ear bones. Um, and so these are your ossicles. And here we have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. So I always used to tell my students just remember miss. Um, if you can remember how it attaches to the tympanic membrane, there's the tympanic membrane, and then you go M-I-S. Um, malleus, incus, here, and stapes is here, okay? And the stapes is the smallest um, bone in the body, believe it or not. So the stapes is the smallest one. 
so what's going to happen is the sound waves will come in here, vibrate the tympanic membrane, and as the tympanic membrane vibrates, then it's going to vibrate these ossicles, the malleus, and then onto the incus, and then onto the stapes. And then the stapes will pass on those vibrations um, at this little window here called the oval window, and it's just right underneath the stapes. And that's going to be where it's going to pass on the vibrations to the vestibular cochlear apparatus. And it'll actually pass on those vibrations um, into pressure waves and the fluid on the other side of that oval window. And then we'll develop these fluid pressure waves that will move all throughout the cochlea. Um, and we'll talk about how that's going to stimulate little hair cells that are going to be responsible for your perception of sound. So that gives you kind of an overview of um, the inner ear. Now, when we look at the inner ear here, you've got, we call this a vestibular cochlear apparatus, and you have the vestibule. This is going to be the vestibule here, and then you have the cochlear, or the cochlea. And the cochlea is going to be responsible for your hearing, and the vestibule is going to be responsible for your sense of balance. So then all this information from the vestibular cochlear apparatus, from the vestibule containing your sense of balance and from your cochlea containing again your sense of hearing, all that information will travel back to the brain via the vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay. Oh, also one other bit of information here. Um, this here is called your um, auditory tube or your eustachian canal more commonly called the eustachian, eustachian canal, or eustachian tube, eustachian tube or eustachian canal. Um, and sorry, if you can't see this, this is an E here. If you can't see my horrible writing here, E-U, that's a U, um, S-T-A-C-H-I-A-N. So that's eustachian. I'll put it off here, eustachian. And what that does is that allows you to um, do things like be able to equalize the pressure inside um, the middle ear here. So for example, when you pop your ears, you're actually allowing the pressure to equalize in here as you get a pressure change on the outside here. Um, and you're uh, allowing it to do that through the pharynx as you allow air into um, the pharynx. So kind of interesting, that's your station tube. Now sometimes you can get um, snot, and you know, for better lack of a word, mucus um, is probably a better word. So you can get mucus that builds up back here in the pharynx, from the nasopharynx as it drains down. And sometimes that mucus can hold on to bacteria and that bacteria can make its way up into the eustachian tube and into the middle ear. And I just recently had this happen, unfortunately. And then as those bacteria... Uh, um, you know, replicate, um, you can end up building up fluid in the inner ear and that puts pressure on the tympanic membrane and causes pain and that's what an ear infection is. Okay, so again, we kind of, we, we've kind of, I've kind of given you an overview of this, but now we'll get into um, what this really does. So again, the external and the middle ear are mainly just transmitting sound waves. Um, to the fluid-filled inner ear, and the inner ear, which is the vestibular cochlear apparatus, um, the inner ear, especially inside the cochlea, is what has the receptors um, that convert sound waves into nerve impulses. And again, the vestibular apparatus up here, um, the vestibular apparatus of the inner ear is involved with our sense of equilibrium, our sense of balance. Okay, so now, now let's talk a little bit again about how this does this. So remember that we have, again, in the middle ear, we have these three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And the reason that we have those three bones, so as the tympanic membrane vibrates, it's going to vibrate these three bones. And you may say, well, why do we have these three bones? What happens is you have the malleus, which is the biggest bone, and then the incus, which is a little bit smaller, and then the stapes, which is even smaller. Um, what this is going to do is this is actually going to amplify um, the the vibrations. So as it transmits the message from the tympanic membrane, um, it's going to amplify those tympanic movements or amplify those um, vibrations as it transmits them to what we call the oval window here. Now the oval window is just where um, 
the vibrations are going to be transmitted from the stapes to the cochlea. And remember, the cochlea is going to look like this, kind of looks like a snail shell here. If you look at this picture of the cochlea here, it looks kind of like a snail shell. It's all wound around, coiled around. And so what happens is inside the cochlea, let me show you here, inside the cochlea here, um, there's fluid. There's fluid-filled tubes inside the cochlea. And so as the vibrations are transmitted down the inner ear bones and then from the stapes to the oval window, then those vibrations will be transferred into pressure waves um, inside the fluid filled in the cochlea. And those pressure waves can travel okay, through the cochlea to where, again, um, depending upon the pitch or tone, um, then they will travel down here and they can stimulate um, the this uh, portion of the um, the portion of the inner ear that contains the tectorial membrane and the um, organ of corti and we'll talk about the organ of corti in just a minute organ of corti so again, the movement um, of the oval window is going to produce waves that travel through the fluid in the cochlea. And then the cochlea, oh, here we go. Here the cochlea then contains the organ of corti, and that's what you see right here. This is the organ of corti right here. And um, it's the sense organ for hearing. And so what happens is as these pressure waves kind of move through this fluid, they'll move down here and be passed into the this area here surrounding the organ of corti. And as we're going to see here in just a minute, the organ of corti contains um, these little inner hair cells with these little hair-like structures that are sticking up. And then it contains this membrane called the tectorial membrane. And as the fluid, you know, as the fluid, there's a pressure wave of fluid that moves through here, it will push down on the tectorial membrane. And will, as that tectorial membrane pushes down on these little hair cells, it will um, move these little hairs and that will stimulate these hair cells and um, will stimulate a nerve impulse. Um, in these nerve auditory nerve fibers that will eventually be sent back to the brain um, through the auditory nerve which will combine auditory nerve will combine um, or meet up with the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve and enter the brain through the vestibular cochlear nerve so here we can see this I just kind of gave you the big overview picture there we can see this a little bit better so again we have these um, uh, hair cells and again a mechanical change meaning that you know pressure wave pushes the tectorial membrane down onto these hair cells um, that's our mechanical change um, will then stimulate these hair cells and will stimulate a nerve impulse and that's how we go from again um, you know a sound wave to a pressure wave then to a nervous signal okay so again, um, then this information will eventually make its way back to the auditory cortex um, of the temporal lobe of the brain where it's processed. Okay. Now the brain interprets this incoming series of signals for sound perception then. So again, remember the brain has to um, perceive this information and uh, again, the brain's responsible for our sound perception. So it's just taking the sensory information and then deciding what to do with it. And again, remember that all of the um, all the information from um, these little hair cells, all of those neurons will combine um, to make up part of the vestibular cochlear nerve because it's coming from the cochlea portion of it. Okay, so that's how we again that's how we go from sound waves to nervous signals. So now. We're going to talk about the vestibular apparatus. And the vestibular apparatus, let me see if I can find a picture. Here's the, remember, here was the vestibular cochlear apparatus, okay? And so remember that coiled portion of the cochlea. This portion with these big semicircular canals up here um, is going to be the vestibular apparatus. And that's the portion um, of the vestibular cochlear apparatus that is responsible for our sense of equilibrium. So 
we have these big, those big semicircular canals of this, the vestibular apparatus are going to be responsible for detecting rotational acceleration or deceleration changes in our body. So especially as you, you know, rotate your head from one side to the other side. And um, again, this is a little more than I care that you have to know because it gets into some details in the end that we just don't have time to get into. But um, again, if you know, re you read this, you have these little cupula um, with these hairs and these little stereocilia hairs here. And um, as you know, fluid is pushed from one side to the other as you're turning your head, um, it will move these little cupula. But again, that's a little more information. I really want you to know that the vestibular apparatus detects our rotational acceleration and deceleration changes in the body. And um, again, this is a little more than you really need to know, um, but we have other portions um, the, of the vestibular apparatus that will um, detect changes in the rate of linear motion um, in any direction. And that's using these little things called autoliths. Um, that are made of calcium carbonate. They're, they're like these little calcium carbonate stones. And I'll show you a picture of these in just a minute. And um, again, we have um, one area called the utricle that will detect horizontal displacement and one area that will detect vertical displacement. So we've got a horizontal displacement and vertical displacement. Again, I, I don't necessarily think it's important that you know the utricle versus the saccule. Um, but what I do want you to know is I want you to know that it contains these little autoliths. And these autoliths, this is kind of interesting, so these autoliths um, will kind of um, sit on um, this, this kind of gelatinous um, material. And this gelatinous material overlays um, these little hair cells. And what happens is, um, for example, if you, if you have your head upright, these autoliths will kind of set here and like so. And then when you bend your head forward, all of these autoliths will be pulled down by obviously gravitational force. And again, these autoliths are just these little kind of calcium carbonate stones. And as they do that, and as they're all pushed down this way, um, they'll actually move that, that gelatinous layer and push on these little hair cells. And that's how you actually detect um, that you've, you know, bent your head forward or that you've done some change in, you know, vertical displacement there. Okay, so um, now let's talk about your the last sense that we're going to talk about, your sense of, oh no, I take that back, we got to do your sense of smell. We only have one slide in your sense of smell, so we'll keep it kind of simple here. But we've got your sense of taste and your sense of smell left. So um, when we talk about your sense of taste, you have chemoreceptors for your sense of taste and your sense of smell. And chemoreceptors just detect, again, chemical changes for your, for, um, your sense of taste and smell. So taste receptors are going to be located within these little taste buds um, in, that are throughout your tongue. And again, um, they're just detecting literally differences in chemicals. And so we have different receptors that will detect different types of chemicals. So again, we have... Um, you know, a, a chemical recept chemoreceptor um, that would detect salt, a chemoreceptor that would detect sweet things um, that have lots of sugar, a chemoreceptor that would detect sour things, and a chemoreceptor that would detect bitter things. So again, these are our four basic tastes, salt, sweet, sour, and bitter, because of the types of chemoreceptors that we have. A fifth taste has recently been recognized called your umami. And your umami taste is your savory taste or your meaty taste. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So any chemical produces the you know, differential stimulation of these four receptors of taste, salt, sweet. So how many salt, sweet, sour, and bitter receptors of each of those, of each of those receptors we stimulate, and of course of your savory umami one, um, is going to determine what flavor you have depending upon your percentage of, again, stimulation of these five receptors. So 
chemo receptors again um, are, are are responsible for our taste sensation, and they're going to root to various areas of the brain because again, these chemo receptors are going to stimulate um, sensory nerve fibers that, and those sensory nerve fibers will carry the nerve impulse back to the brain. And so some of these nerve fibers are going to innervate the limbic system, and that will give us kind of our emotional and behavioral responses to certain tastes. So, for example, you know, maybe um, you taste tequila, and you've had a very bad experience with tequila, you know, when you were um, maybe younger or maybe recently. <laughs> and so now you taste tequila, and um, it makes you feel kind of sick gives you this kind of sick feeling. Um, that was because you've produced an emotional response that's gone through the limbic system associated with that flavor. And then, of course, you also have, again, um, some of these nerves coming from, again, your taste receptors are going to move through the thalamus. That's a relay station, remember? So go through the thalamus and then to the cortical gustatory area in the parietal lobes. And again, the word gustatory is associated with taste. I want you to think of taste when you hear that word gustatory, okay? So again, our fifth sense is our umami sense now that we, you know, uh, know about this fifth sense, umami. Oops, sorry, I meant to box that in. And um, this is um, better known as the sense where you taste dead things. Um, and that's because you are um, typically the umami um, receptors are picking up glutamate, which is just an amino acid. And of course, we have um, lots of amino, amino acids make up our protein. So we have lots of protein in meat um, because there's lots of protein in muscle, right? So, um, that's why, again, we stimulate these receptors when we eat lots of meat or we eat dead things. <laughs> so, and this is what gives us our savory or meaty flavor. Also, um, another thing that stimulates them is MSG. Monosodium glutamate, um, stimulates MSG. And I know we have lots of MSG in foods because, um, you know, it gives us, it gives it that savory or meaty flavor. So that's your fifth sense. I taste dead things. <laughs> okay, our last slide here is going to talk about olfactory. Olfactory is going to be your sense of smell. Okay, this is your sense of smell. So olfactory receptors in the nose are these specialized nerve endings um, that of these afferent neurons. So these are our olfactory receptors, these specialized nerve endings here. And these olfactory receptors... Um, and sorry, these are the neurons that they're connecting with, but these are these are the actual olfactory receptors right here in this picture. And um, these olfactory receptors are going to occur on the superior surface of um, the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx. And this will make a little more sense when we do the digestive system and you actually learn what the nasopharynx is. But it's going to be this cavity um, where when you breathe in, again, um, air it goes into this um, cavity, the nasopharynx, that will eventually connect um, down to the trachea because um, the pharynx can uh, eventually connect to the trachea and then the esophagus. But um, again, that's how um, we're going, that's where the um, olfactory receptors in the nose are going to be is in the nasopharynx. And you can see they occur in a really high density in about a, a, in a small area and a high density in about three centimeters squared. Um, so again, it's a, just a small area on the nasopharynx where you have a bunch of these um, olfactory receptors. And these olfactory receptors here will be stimulated by um, different, again, um, chemicals that we're breathing in, right? So these chemicals that we're breathing in will stimulate, just drawing some of these chemicals in. Maybe it's an, od you know, very um, odiferous, stinky odiferous <laughs> chemical, like, uh, you know, the chemicals from a skunk spray, okay? And so they'll stimulate um, these certain chemoreceptors here um, and that superior surface of the nasopharynx. And then those will stimulate um, these neurons. So they'll it'll stimulate a nerve impulse, and that nerve impulse will, be, will then be passed on to um, another set of neurons that will take the information back to the brain. 
And what's cool here is, I don't know if you guys remember the ethmoid bone, um, but the ethmoid bone um, actually has a, this little plate called the cribriform plate, and it has a bunch of holes in it. And those holes are um, because the olfactory nerves have to travel up through them. So um, our olfactory receptors um, are going to be replaced about every two months. So old ones die off and new ones are, re are um, uh, again, um, new ones come in to take its place. And it's because we have kind of these little stem cells that replace these stem cells in this layer that will replace um, and replenish those receptors. And um, different olfactory receptors are going to detect discrete parts of an odor. So again, you're going to see that we have different um, receptors that detect different smells or different chemicals that make up that odor. And odor discrimination is coded by, again, um, patterns of activity in the olfactory bulb glomeruli. And so here are these olfactory bulb glomeruli. And this is actually in the olfactory bulb. So we have these big bulbs called the olfactory bulbs. And um, sorry, excuse my dogs here if you can hear that barking in the background. But um, so these um, olfactory bulbs are going to be these big bulges where we have all of these olfactory bulb glomeruli. And that's where we're going to be able to, again, um, discern and discriminate against different types of um, odors. And depending upon just exactly which of these um, olfactory receptors we've stimulated. That's a little bit more than honestly I care for you to know, um, just because it's, it's very hard for me. There's so much more that goes into this. You're just getting this little bit of this picture. Um, but what I really want you to know is that there are different olfactory receptors that detect discrete parts of an odor, um, that they're in the superior surface of the nasopharynx, and that that information is then sent back to the brain through the olfactory nerve. Um, we also have the um, VMO organ, the vomeronasal organ. And the vomeronasal organ is um, alongside the vomer. Remember the vomer um, is that bone that makes up, helps make up the nasal septum. And it actually detects pheromones. So it's kind of cool when you think about, um, I don't know if you've seen some of um, the, the recent stuff. I, uh, there's been like a Nova special um, on the oh, chemistry of love. And, and um, they've done some interesting experiments with detecting pheromones. Um, and these pheromones um, are these... Um, are, are literally going to be these uh, proteins that we produce that we can detect. We actually can detect. We just don't consciously detect them. And so, for example, um, to give you an idea of what they did with some of these pheromones, um, one of the studies they did, they took a bunch of men and they made them wear these um, white t-shirts while they were exercising and especially while they were sweating hard. And then what they would do is they would take these t-shirts sweaty t-shirts off and they would put them in these jars and then they would have women come in and they would have women smell these sweaty t-shirts at different times of the month. And what they found is that women um, on average would rate these sweaty t-shirts um, at a much higher rate in terms of how good they smelled, believe it or not. Um, they would rate them higher when they were in estrus, when they were ovulating. And it was because, again, that there are pheromones that are released in our sweat, and those pheromones were found, you know, women found those pheromones to, you know, be smelling good um, when they were in estrus or when they were um, in ovulation. So kind of interesting studies that they've done with pheromones. Also, they've done um, some other studies where they took these, I know they do some weird stuff here, but they took these little pads and they put them, um, absorbent pads, and they put them underneath the armpits of um, women. And what they did was they took, um, you know, two groups of women, one that wore the armpit pads and brought them in and donated them. The other group of women, these poor women, I don't know why they volunteered to do this, volunteered to come in and smell the armpit pads. And they, again, um, didn't live with the other group of women because they wanted to make sure that they were separate from each other. So they would just come in every day and smell these armpit pads. And what they found is that their cycles um, would match up over time. And it was, again, because of the detection of pheromones um, from 
from the sweat on the armpit pads. So when they say that, you know, women's cycle, that a bunch of women that work together, and they end up on the same cycle, um, it can't happen because of the release of pheromones. And again, we're, we're detecting those pheromones. It's just through a different organ called the VMO. So anyway, there's my interesting studies for you. I'll have to find, I'll try to find the, um, the special, the NOVA special that was done um, that talks about pheromones, and I'll post that on Canvas for you, and that way then you can watch the NOVA special yourself. And I think that is it for the special senses. Um, if you have any questions on the special senses, please um, contact me, and that will be the end of the material for the next exam. So, um, again, feel free to... Um, email me, um, or you can write to me on the discussion board. Please feel free to write discussion or questions to me on the discussion board. Um, and that's always a nice way for me to answer questions so that everyone then um, can get the question and the answer as well. All right. Have a good night.